Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, EC Distinguished uh, Webinar. Uh, today, it's our pleasure. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor John Jock Griffey uh, as our distinguished speaker. Uh, Professor uh, John Jock Griffey received his uh, PhD in solid state physics in 1988 from University uh, Paris Sud. He is a professor at uh, Institute of Optics and University of uh, Paris Beckley and a senior member of Institute and University of France. Uh, he, he, he first studied light matter scattering of electromagnetic waves and, uh, excuse me, light scattering of electromagnetic waves and theory of near field microscopy. He, uh, in fact, in my PhD, I have read many of his papers. Uh, he has made uh, seminal contributions to uh, near field microscopy and plasmonics. And he revisited thermal emission at nanoscale and discovered the role of surface waves to produce spatially coherent thermal sources and to enhance near field radiative heat transfer. He made contributions to the field of nano antennas, including the proposal for using nano antennas with the single quantum emitters to control lifetime and directional emission. Uh, his uh, current research interests uh, deal with uh, uh, revisiting fundamental. Uh, quantum optics experiments with surface plasmons, and today we'll hear uh, more about that in this talk. Uh, he's uh, currently an OSA fellow and uh, the recipient of uh, Servant Prize of uh, French Academy of Sciences. Um, for Professor Griffin. Thank you, Guru, very much for this very kind invitation. I wish I could be visiting Houston. I guess it's more sunny than here. Um, so today I will be uh, talking and summarizing what we did in the past uh, eight years on quantum plasmatics. Uh, so the idea was really to merge uh, quantum optics and, and surface plasma. So this is the people who did the work, Francois Marquier and Gaëtan Messin. Uh, most of the early work was done in the PhD by Marie-Christine Deur and then Benjamin Vest during his postdoc and in Schlesinger. We collaborated, the sample was done in the group of Thomas Epsen by Eloise Deveau. And uh, the design of the samples that we'll be showing were done by Philippe Lalanne in, at the Institute of Optics in, in Bordeaux. And uh, Alexandre Baron did the, all the measurements on these samples. I think there is not much need to explain what is a surface plasmon uh, in this audience. Uh, you know that it's... Uh, Polariton, which means that it's both a photon and a mechanical wave. It's a charge, surface charge density. So this is a sketch of these surface charges. And uh, um, since it's partly a photon, you can assume that everything that is known from quantum optics would work. And since it's also uh, partly a wave in a metal, you can fear that there might be a lot of losses and uh, some dephasing mechanism. So whether uh, quantum physics will survive is not entirely clear. Uh, you could uh, have a lot of decoherence. So one of the issues is to investigate to what extent uh, we can reproduce a basic textbook quantum optics experiment. And that's what I'm going to, to show. The motivation to study quantum plasmonics is, and it's, it's here summarized in this graph where here we have the size that would be the wavelength. This is the typical length scale for sizes when you deal with light. This is intensity and that would be uh, the intensity of a photon. So when you go from classical optics to uh, extremely low energies, you are entering the quantum optics regime, when you have a single few photons. When you go from classical optics to sub-wavelength scales, you enter the nanophotonics regime. And here we want to explore what happens in the nanoscale regime with few photons. And for that, of course, plasmons are a good candidate. They are one of the workhorses of nanophotonics. Uh, there have been... Um, several works showing uh, that it is possible to do quantum optics with plasmons um, almost 10 years, 20 years ago. So entanglement is preserved when you, you look at a photon 
that goes across a, a system which is a grid of holes similar to what Thomas Epson have been uh, introducing. And uh, this is a, uh, the, the simple situation where you have a nano road and a single molecule emitter that emits a, a quantum. This quantum excites a quantum of plasma, which then is radiated, and this uh, light is quantum. And this is a correlation showing that, uh, proving that we are in the, in the single excitation regime. Um, so, in in the, we we did a, a series of experiments with plasmons. We wanted to deal with uh, the standard plasmon propagating on a flat surface, not guided by wires. And uh, we will be exploring four experiments. The first one is wave particle duality. The second one is the Ongu Mandel experiment. Then we will uh, do experiments trying to check entanglement between plasmons and photons. And finally, I would like to report experiments on Fox states with more than one photon. And uh, in particular, I studied the noon state case, if I have time. So here, to start with wave particle duality, we simply reproduced an, a historical experiment performed by one of my colleagues here in Paris at the Institute of, Opt of Optics more than 30 years ago. Uh, that was in the group of Alain Aspe. Uh, he was preparing his uh, well-known experiments on violation of Bell inequalities. And for that, he had designed a source of two photons. And that was essentially the first single photon source uh, ever. Uh, it's a cascade in an atom where uh, in the decay, you move from an excited state to an intermediate state, and then from the intermediate state to the fundamental state. Then you emit two photons with a typical delay about four nanoseconds, which is the lifetime of the intermediate state. And you use the first photon that Herald announces that the second photon is coming. And uh, that allows you to identify in time when the second photon is coming. So you know that you have a single photon because on the first place you had a single excitation in the atom. And then this photon is coming at a beam splitter. And if it's a classical wave, you would have 50% transmitted, 50% reflected, but because it's a single photon, it's entirely transmitted or entirely reflected. So that if you make the product of these two signals, for a classical wave, it's non-zero and uh, for a photon, it's zero. And that's what is plotted here. This, uh, this is the this well known now G2 term uh, as a function of the time window here where we are collecting light. And as you reduce this time window where you detect the light, uh, you make sure that only, uh, uh, only one photon can come at the same time. So you should end up as this time is reduced to zero. And that's indeed what has been observed. So that was, that's how we prove that we, are, we have single photons. Now, what they did was, uh, this is a, the smoking gun proof that you have particles, quantized packet of energies. Now the question is, okay, since these are particles, do we still have interferences? So you take this source of single photons and you send the single photons in an interferometer, which is a Max Zender interferometer. So this is beam splitter, another one, a mirror, and another mirror. We have two passes. You can move this mirror so that the path length here changes, and you can record the interferences on these two output uh, detectors. And of course, you expect to see, if you have a classical wave, you expect to see interferences, which is what is seen, but uh, this is constructing single event by single event in the single photon regime. So, so, so that's the beauty of the system. You, you have this truly single photon source. So this is more than just an attenuated classical wave. Uh, it's, it's really a single photon source because you are detecting only when you had the announcement. So this is really, uh, as shown before, a single photon. And despite the fact that it's a quantum particle, you do observe 
uh, these interferences. So this is this standard wave particle duality. So we want to reproduce that. So nowadays uh, we have much better sources of single photons. Those are based on uh, parametric down conversion on PPKTP uh, crystals. Uh, we re checked that the photons emitted by this source were indeed single photons by reproducing the same experiment. So, so far we, are, we have photons. We just benefit from the progress of the technology and we have much better single photon sources these days. Then we wanted to convert those photons into plasmons. So for that, we needed a converter and this is a grating. It's a very particular grating designed by Philippe Lalanne. Uh, if you look at here, the widths of the lines, you see that this one is very narrow, this one is broad. So actually this has been optimized. Not only the widths are different, but the depths are different. So the only way to fabricate this is to use FIB. Uh, focus ion beam to mill. And this has been um, done, as, as I said, in the group of Thomas Epson. So this is a, a remarkable beam splitter that is able to convert 50% of the incident power into a plasmon, which is launched in this direction. And essentially nothing goes in the other direction. So we have a unidirectional uh, coupler with 50% efficiency. The rest goes into losses. So by shining light here, we launch a plasmon. And here we have now two uh, grooves which uh, form a beam splitter. And again, this beam splitter is, has uh, about 25% transmission, 25% reflection. Uh, so it's balanced. And the rest goes into ohmic losses and relative losses. So it's a lossy beam splitter. We cannot have a non lossy beam splitter. And this is important for the rest of the story. So keep in mind this beam splitter is a plasmonic beam splitter, but it's a lossy one. Then uh, here we just remove the gold. This is gold deposited on top of silica. And when the plasmon arrives here at the edge, then it's coupled. It's not a nice coupler. Uh, so we collect all the energy, but the shape of the beam is kind of awful. It's diffracted, so keep that in mind also. That means that starting from here, so here we have a nice Gaussian beam, here we have a nice uh, plasmon, and here the mode of the photon is highly distorted by this diffraction coupling. So the shape of the mode here is not so well controlled. Keep that in mind. Um, Okay, the experiment is then to send the single photon to couple. So now here we have a single plasmon. The single plasmon goes into the beam splitter. We detect here and here. We do the correlation. And this is a correlation of plasmons. So the correlation is this is converted back into photon and we do detect photons. Uh, and we again see the same story. So, so that's the direct proof of yes, we have single plasmons. And now we build an interferometer just to keep reproducing, mimicking the historical experiments. So this is a photonic beam splitter. This is one photon, the other one, they are the, the one pass, the other pass, it's a photonic pass, arriving here on these two couplers. And this is the second beam splitter which of the interferometer, but it's a plasmonic beam splitter. We are recombining. Uh, and uh, we look at what we observe and we do observe with this single plasmons interferences. Uh, note that the minimum of this uh, interference does not coincide with the maximum here. This is because of the losses. If there are no losses, essentially you should have sine plus cosine equal one, sine square plus cosine square equal one. That's what, and that's energy conservation. It's, but of course, there is no energy conservation. So you see that there is a shift here. OK, so this is a summary. Uh, with this uh, beam splitter, plasmonic beam splitter, we can uh, use it to check with the usual procedure that, yes, we have single plasmons. And we can build a plasmonic interferometer and observe interferences. 
the next uh, step was to try to observe a two photon property, a pure quantum effect, which is the, the well known Ongu Mandel experiment. So let me tell you what this is. Imagine that you have two identical photons. So one is coming here, the other one is coming here. Just for the clarity of explanation, I'm using different colors, but they are identical. They have the same frequency. These two photons, they have the same polarization and they are in the same state. So of course, one possible outcome is this one. This is another one and two more. So those are the four possible outcomes. Now it turns out that if you do the quantum calculation of what's happening, this one is suppressed. And it is suppressed because when you look at the contribution of these two paths, it turns out that they cancel. So these two are the two possibilities where you would have one photon here and one photon here. If you do the quantum calculation of the probability of having one photon on this path and one photon here, so that's this probability, it's given by this term. And it turns out that if you have a, a standard good beam splitter such that the reflectivity is equal to plus or minus IT, where T is transmission, then this is zero. So that means that these two paths cancel and therefore you are left only with two possibilities, which means that when two identical photons come simultaneously to a beam splitter, they merge and they live together either on this side or on this side. It's love at first sight, they get married immediately on the beam splitter and they live together. Uh, this has been achieved by several groups using uh, guided plasmas. And uh, the proof, how do you prove that this happens? Again, you look at the correlation at the two outputs, since they both live together here or here, if you make the correlation, the product of the two output, you get zero. And that's indeed what happens. So what is shown here is the, the path difference, the time difference, for arrival time of the two photons here on the beam splitter. So of course, it's one coming first, the other next, they don't meet, they don't get married. Uh, so as a function of time, when they coincide on the beam splitter, then you expect an anti-correlation. And this is clearly observed in all these experiments. Uh, so this is what we were trying to do, but instead of these experiments, we were not using guided plasmons. We were using just standard plasmons propagating on planar surfaces. And this is our, our experiment. So we, we generate uh, the plasmon here. So here we have a polarizing beam splitter. So we send the two, the two photons here. So this is not yet recombination. We still have the two photons here. Then they are focused on the two gratings. And now we have two plasmons. And now these two plasmons are identical. And here they recombine on this plasmonic beam splitter. And we expect to see two plasmons here or two plasmons here. But this is if you have the standard beam splitter with energy conservation. Actually, you may also have a different phase. Because of the non-conservation of energy, it is possible to design a beam splitter with such a property. In that case, if you have this type of relation, then the probability of having one photon on a given pass, output pass, and also a photon on the other pass, this is possible. So they add, they don't cancel. So this is not love at first sight, hate at first sight, and then they live on separate channels, okay? And this is indeed what we observed. So we managed to do both types of uh, beam splitters, and we do find the coalescence, the bosonic coalescence, and the anti-coalescence uh, of bosons on the beam splitter. Uh, so this is really not uh, a plasmonic property. It's a loss system property. So you can do that with photons if you use a, a loss beam feature also. It is a, a strange, yes. Uh, there is a question. Um, 
I think Narmada, do you want to speak? Uh, yeah, so uh, when you said that the two photons uh, combine or marry, as you quoted, together, do you mean that the energy of it uh, combines and there's a higher energy photon or two photons in a particular direction uh, with the same energies as before? Yeah, the final state is two photons on the output channel. Okay. Thank you. So, so, so you end up, you are producing a Fox state where the number, the occupation number is two. Yeah, yeah. thank you. And uh, when we, you do the theory of this process where with this unusual connection between the transmission and reflection of the uh, beam splitter, then it turns out that uh, um, the probability of having only one photon absorb, so one photon is emerging on one channel and zero on the other one, so one photon was absorbed, this is zero. So you can have absorption of the two photons, or you can have no absorption at all. This is what we measured. Uh, but in this situation, it's a, a very particular situation where absorption of a single photon is forbidden. So th this is really a quantum absorption regime. Th there is no such an equivalent in classical physics. Either you absorb two photons or zero. That, that had been predicted by Stephen Barnett uh, in 98. And uh, this, this device is operating in this regime. Okay, so now I would like to discuss uh, entanglement. So I would like to uh, tell you how it's possible to prepare um, a surface plasma which is entangled with a photon, and then by making measurement on the photon to make a, uh, to control the state of the plasma. So that's called the projective measurement on the photon. So first of all, I need to generate an entangled state with two photons. So we take uh, this two photon source, the one I showed in the beginning. And now they are not identical. One is the blue is edge polarized, horizontal polarization. And the red here, it's the vertically polarized photon. So we send two photons with different polarization. This is a standard beam splitter. This is not a polarizing beam splitter. It's a standard one. So this horizontally polarized photon can be either reflected or transmitted. So these are two possible outcomes. You also have those ones. There is no Angu Mandel effect here because the photons are different. They have a different polarization. So this is just standard stuff. Now, in what follows, the only type of measurement that we're going to do are correlation of the output here and here. So if this event happen, its contribution to coloration measurement is zero because here is zero. So these two events do exist, but I don't measure them because I only do correlation measurements. So I don't see them. So because of the type of measurement I'm doing, I'm post selecting these two ones and I'm rejecting these two. So this is called post selection. So they do exist, but because of the type of measurement I do, I post select these two. So I'm only working with these two. And this, what is this? This is either a, a horizontally polarized photon on channel A, and for channel B, it's vertically polarized or vice versa. This is an entangled state. I cannot factorize this state saying, okay, photon alpha has this wave function and photon B has this wave function and it's the product. I cannot do that. If I do a measurement on alpha, and if I happen to find that here, this photon alpha is horizontally polarized, then it has to be this state. It cannot be that one. So necessarily, beta will be vertically polarized and vice versa. So it's very simple. I just take two 
polarized photons, one horizontal, the other one vertical, I combine on the standard beam splitter. They need to come at the same time. This is very critical. If they don't arrive at the same time, then I don't have this state because there is one crossing the beam splitter first and the other one later. So there is no, uh, they have an extra label. So I can write this way. So if they merge, if they arrive at the same time here, they don't merge. If they arrive at the same time here, I am preparing this state. Okay. So it, it's very important to control the timing. Okay. So now we know how to prepare an entangled state of photons. So one of the photons goes there. I use a polarizer and I detect the photon with a single photon detector. The other one goes into a polarizing beam splitter. And here, what I'm going to do is to convert the polarization state of this beta photon into a path. Because it's a polarizing beam splitter, this photon beta is either horizontal or vertical. If it's horizontal, it goes into this direction. If it's vertical, it goes into this direction. So I'm converting the polarization into a path. And if it goes into this path, I'm, it's beta two, it's path number two, I take it to my plasmonic chip and it gets there. If it was vertically polarized, it goes to channel one and it ends up here. So depending on the initial polarization, now I have a plasmon here or a plasmon here. So I have converted polarization into path. So I have a polarization path entanglement now. Instead of polarization, polarization entanglement, it's polarization path entanglement. So whether, so what I can do is I choose the polarization here. So for instance, if here I'm measuring horizontal, if I happen to have a click for horizontal, it means that beta is vertical. If beta is vertical, it's here. This is channel one. So I will have a plasmon here and no plasmon here. A plasmon here, I make a correlation measurement. What I, I look at the detection here, what happens? Well, uh, it's either transmitted or reflected. There are no interferences. And now I turn by 45 degrees this polarizer. So if I can detect a click, even if it's H or it's V, both states can give me a signal. So I'm detecting these two. So when it's 45 degrees here, then I have a superposition of channel one and channel two. So I still have a single photon beta, but it could be here or here. So then if the photon beta is here or here, if they can interfere. And now I move this mirror here. And if I look at the signal, it has, it shows an interference. This path has a lens, which is no longer equal to that one. As I change the lens, I observe an interference as a function of the lens of this path difference between the two channels. So depending on the orientation of polarizer, I'm sending a photon only on one channel, no interferences, or 45 degrees. It's either here or here. It's a quantum superposition. So this quantum superposition produces an interference, and I should see interferences. So I'm making measurements on alpha and I expect to observe interference or not observe interferences with single plasmon beta. So let's do it. This is the uh, interference that you observe when you are, have a polarizer at 45 degree. Then you turn the polarizers to uh, zero degree and you suppress the interferences. The other thing you can do as a further check is to decrease the quality of the entanglement. How can we do that? 
as I mentioned, to have entangled photons, they need to arrive simultaneously on the beam splitter. Uh, so if I introduce a decay, a, a shift in the arrival time of the two photons on the beam splitter that was is producing the pair of entangled photons, uh, then I, I reduce what is called the Bell parameter, which is a qu a quantitative measurements of the degree of entanglement. And of course, I suppress uh, this uh, uh, interference. So here we are showing that it is possible to perform a projective measurement on a photon to control the plasmonic state. Uh, that works very nicely. And it survives pretty well all the losses that we have on the system. I didn't mention, but this system is extremely lossy. I, I didn't mention that we have 50% losses in the coupling here. But then the propagation over metal introduces a lot of losses, and the conversion here also introduces losses. By the way, um, let me go back here showing the this peak for the ongu mandel effect or this dip, uh, if we, a beautiful experiment should show a zero here. The anti-correlation should be zero. So if it's not zero, it means that the two states which are interfering are not identical. And the reason they are not identical is because of what I said, the control of the quality of the photonic state is not optimum because of the coupling through these uh, slits. Uh, okay, let me now move to uh, the noon states and the Fox states. Uh, a fog, so just look at this state here. So this is a photonic state with N photons. Uh, if we have two modes, like the two channels that we were discussing before, uh, uh, this is a, a particular state where you have N excitations for one plasmon and zero for the other one. So this is a, a particular Fox state. And now if you produce this state where those, again, this is pass one and this is pass two in our plasmonic chip. So you can have a superposition of N photons on one pass and zero or zero and N. So if you read this, this N O, O N, this is called the noon state. It's just a superposition of two Fox states. Now, these Fox states are interesting um, and they might have beautiful applications for sensing. Let me try to explain why. Uh, to, to produce such a Fox state, you start from vacuum. And then you use a creation operator. You apply n times this creation operator, and uh, you are creating your n photons. Now, this is essentially showing up in the form of the in the quantized form of the electric field operator. And when you have this creation operator, you also have a phase. The electric field has a phase, a special phase which is exponential i k. If you look at the propagation of a state over a given quantity delta x, some displacement delta x, then the dephasing is exponential i k delta x. That, that's what you have in, in your field. But if the operator is the field to the power n, then this phase also came to the power n. So now, if you are using this state instead of a single photon state for the same displacement, you have a phase variation which is n times larger. And that is a promise of increasing the sensitivity of some displacement measurement uh, by the factor n. So if you are able to produce such a Fox state, which is not, not an easy task, then you can expect to have an increase in the phase measurement. Now, if you want to do that with plasmons, you need to account for losses. It happens that, so we show this in this paper, this formula is valid for complex K. 
And that means that the losses are also increased by a factor n. And this is very bad news for plasmonic sensing because if you have a plasmon with a propagation length of 10 micron, and if you want to use a Fox state with 10 photons, then the propagation length of your Fox state is no longer 10 microns, it becomes one micron, which is quite short. Uh, it's easy to get some physical insight on why this happens. Uh, I, let me stress that this is extremely different from what happens with a wave packet, a classical wave packet with 10 photons. You can have a pulse of light with 10 photons, but just a, a, a standard classical uh, coherent wave packet. And of course, if you absorb one photon out of the 10, this is what happens when you have absorption, when a pulse is propagated in the lossy media, you essentially have the same state with an average number of photons, which is no longer 10 by nine, but it's the same state and it has the same phase. If you have a Fox state with N photons, and if you absorb one photon out of the 10, then you have a new Fox state, which is a different Fox state with nine photons, and it's a totally different state. So if you absorb one out of 10 photons, you totally kill your state and you move to a totally different state. So, so that's why uh, it's so fragile, this Fox state. And that's why its decay length is uh, so dramatically reduced, which is of course very bad news for practical applications. Nevertheless, uh, it's interesting to try to observe if this behavior can be um, checked with plasmons. So we did form a Fox state, a noon state with two photons. So for that, uh, we used Angu Mandel experiment. So you, we have our two photons here. We send them on a beam splitter. Now they have the same polarization. They arrive at the same time. And because of Angu Mandel, we either have two photons here or two photons here. So that's exactly a noon state where n is two. So Angu Mandel produces for you a noon state, two zero or two zero. And you have a superposition of these two. You don't know where they go. So that's what we do. We send our noon state on the two gradings. Now we have two plasmons. It's a superposition of noon plasmonic state. They interfere. So they merge here on the beam splitter. So now we have an interference. And if what I told you is true, then I should have less signal, but still I can count photons. So it's, it's just a matter of waiting. And uh, we have a phase, which is shorter. We have a wave vector, which is twice larger. So if we look at the spacing of the interferences, it should be smaller. So it's the same experiment as before. So here is the interference. We plotted this, we made the Fourier analysis of this interferogram to see where are the frequencies. And we do see here a frequency in terms of wavelength and we see twice uh, the, the, the frequency. So that's the wave vector, which is multiplied by two. That's the known component. So, so this is a really a Fox state property. So this is a totally quantum property uh, that we do observe here uh, with plasmons. So yes, all these quantum properties survives. Uh, in that particular instance, as I mentioned, uh, the state is fragile and very sensitive to losses. Uh, but uh, we, we have observed. So to summarize, uh, I've, we re did reproduce the historical experiments on wave particle duality with plasmons first. So that's the, what is now called HBT, Hamburg, Brown and Twist uh, setup to check the correlation and show that we have particles particle behavior. 
With this single photon sent into a Max Zander interferometer, we did observe a plasmonic Max Zander interferometer, we did observe uh, interferences. We were able to observe coalescence and, and but also anti-coalescence of plasmons. So this is really uh, a proof of indistinguishability of these uh, plasmons. Uh, we can do entangled states and use this entangled state to do projective measurements and control the plasmonic state by doing measurements on the photon. And finally, we did uh, generate noon states and, and we were able to observe the interferences, uh, the phase making measurement of the, the large uh, wave vector of this uh, Fox state. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, I'll be happy to answer any question. Thank you, uh, Professor Griffith. Please, uh, if you have any questions, please uh, um, <clears throat> let, let us know. I think I can allow you to speak. Uh, while I think we get questions, uh, may I ask you about this? So we did uh, talk a little bit about uh, non-Hermitian physics, etc., in our previous meeting. So the plasmons, especially here, it, I mean, it's a it's a plasmon propagating on a on a interface with metal and dielectric. Both are semi-infinite. Of course, we know that the losses are small in this case compared to, for example, metal insulator, metal configuration, etc., where the confinement is tighter. So this is still that way a relatively low loss platform for, for plasmons. Um, and yet, of course, there is absorption here. So can this absorption be included in your Hamiltonian itself and then treated as to just the way how we do, for example, with, uh, the, the quantum optics stuff. So with absorption, what would we predict? Can we actually include that in, uh, in the modeling itself um, instead of uh, doing all the experiment, the, 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 the quantum experiments, assuming that there is no absorption or trying to reproduce those results. Okay, two, two answers. Uh, first, when we model the absorption, we use uh, the linear absorption model. Mm -hmm. um, and what you can do is, uh, this is standard technique in quantum optics is to assume that you have beam splitters uh, and uh, they, they allow you to model uh, linear absorption. And with that, uh, you can uh, model everything that you observe. That, 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 that's one thing. The second thing is, uh, is that in practice, when you do experiments, you have a laser you send to your down converter and you generate typically 10 million photons per second. Then you send them on the device. Uh, then you have 5 million uh, plasmons per second generated. Mm -hmm. And uh, you detect them one by one. So what happens is that out of these 5 million plasmons generated, some of them will be absorbed. But if they are absorbed, they are totally absorbed. They are not partially absorbed. So they just disappear. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that at the end of the day, when you detect them, instead of 5 million, you, you have uh, like 50,000. Uh, but the ones that you detect, those ones, they had no absorption at all. Yeah. So whenever you do an experiment, you are dealing with a photon that has not been absorbed at all. Mm. It's only that your signal is smaller, the rate of photons coming to the detector is lower, mm -hmm. but you are playing with the winners. Of course. <laughs> the, you, and the winners, they have not suffered any loss. Yeah. It's just that you had to pay a price for that. And you need to try many times, and uh, it's only a few times that you can measure them at the end of but those which make it, they had no losses at all. So I had a question um, regarding the, so if you could go back to the slide where the, the photon is converted to a plasmon um, via that specialized grading with those random depths. Um, 
I was wondering, is the, you know, how was that, uh, you said it was optimized. How was that, uh, yeah, how was that grading pattern or depth pattern, whatever you call it? Um, uh, with FIB, generally... with Optus Ion Beam. Uh, yeah, here, here we have an, uh, uh, yeah. it, it's more or less like that. It, is, it, the, is it just random or has it been? No, 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 no. Oh my God, no. Yeah, I was, I was wondering. Oh, no, no, no. This is two, two or three years of work, only that. Wow. I see, I see. So everything but random. No, this is first of all, uh, this is first of all three years of development of codes. Uh -huh. Then it's six months of running codes to optimize the design. I see, I see. Then it's years of uh, using FIB optimizing the shape. Oh my and God. then it's one more year of a postdoc uh, making all the measurements <laughs> to check uh, whether it works okay. <laughs> Okay, wow. uh, and this is like six years of development. My goodness. Okay, so uh, I and mean, we're very proud to make it to fifty percent at the end of the day. So no, it's not random at all. Got it. Got it. Got it. Um, so the, the design you said that part of the design of this thing was done using code and optimization algorithm yeah. as opposed to, you know, physicist uh, intuition. Absolutely. Um, is it understood then how this thing actually operates? Are the physical principles by by which it works understood, or is that kind of a mis no? A this is purely optim numerical optimization. I see. And um, here we are. That, that's an interesting question. Uh, no, the shape is really. In some cases, you do optimization, you end up with something that makes sense, and you say, "Oh yes, I could have thought of that." This right. is absolutely not the case here. Is it at all? I have no idea why this is a good solution. And there are other solutions. So this is one among other I solutions. See. I see. Um, and this is a real complex problem where you, you take advantage of uh, the power of computers. Now, this is not uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Of course, of course. This is just standard optimization. Optimization. Uh, so you take uh, the different methods for uh, optimization, like this was done by Philippe and my colleagues. I, I don't know which one they use, maybe a conjugated gradient technique, or this This is the type of techniques that they are using. OK. Is it at all of interest to you? Is it of interest to try and uh, understand what principles, if any, are being employed here, and then design a better optimization that could scale better, faster? Is that useful? I I don't think. Uh, I, I love to have uh, physical intuition on how things work. <laughs> for, for this class of problems, I don't think it's relevant. I think. The, these problems are so complex. The number of variables is so large that uh, what you can expect from optimization is beyond your understanding. And uh, I recommend you to look at papers by Yelena Vukovic on uh -huh. numerical optimization of systems, yeah. where you look at them and you immediately give up trying to figure out uh, <laughs> why it works. <laughs> but it works amazingly well. Wow. OK, thank you. <laughs> That's a challenge. Yes. Uh, thank you, Ankit, uh, for that question. Yeah. Um, there has been a lot of uh, now optimization work coming uh, coming out on how to uh, address this inverse problem for a given functionality, what kind of design uh, achieves that functionality. Uh, are there any other uh, questions? Uh, may I just uh, ask about the single photon source that you used. Um, did you uh, develop the single photon source or just if I want to set uh, this experiment up in my lab? So I'm just curious, what would I? Yes, actually we bought the crystal. Mm -hmm. We bought the laser. And uh, yeah, that was like one year of work to have the single photon source uh, operating nicely. Yes, yeah. okay. So that, that was in developing the lab and we, we did benefit a lot from the expertise of Gaëtan Messin, one of the co-authors who had experience in doing that. Okay. Uh, yes, it's not, uh, it's not a piece of cake.
Well, I think if uh, there are no more questions, uh, let's thank the speaker and uh, hope we can bring you to campus uh, uh, when things are much better with travel. Thank you very much. Thank you.